let's take out our Bibles and learn together. Many times in our churches, we don't hear much about the wrath of God. People, they don't want to know about God's wrath. They don't want to believe that this New Testament God is the same God of the Old Testament, that He's a God of judgment. They don't know and understand the purposes. Why would God judge? And the reason is this, because He's a holy and righteous God. And when we look prophetically, and I'm speaking about Old Testament prophecy and also prophecy in the New Covenant, we see that the purpose of God's judgment is to bring about his order. What type of order? A kingdom order. So make no mistake, we see throughout the New Testament, when we look at Messiah's teaching, when we look at Paul's teaching, when we look at John's teaching, and all the apostles, they speak about a time coming at the end of this age, what we call the last days, where God will indeed pour out judgment, specifically his wrath. Now, if we're going to understand what happens in this world, we always have to ask ourselves, what is the source of what's taking place? Because we know this church in, in Thessaloniki, it's being persecuted, intensely being persecuted. They are experiencing tribulations in the plural, abundant, abundant trials and affliction but none of that is from God God will use it in order to to give evidence to others of their faith and God will use it in order to reward them for their endurance and their perseverance but the source of this persecution in that time going back 1900 years ago almost what we do what do we see it's the enemy they are suffering why because of their faith and what we see prophetically is that this world is not moving towards righteousness this world is not experiencing the light of God his revelation in in very clear and bold terms quite the difference we're seeing that the world that we're in is becoming dark and it will become darker and darker more unrighteous, it will become ripe and ready for God's judgment. And how we know that we're getting close to that time of God's judgment is that there's going to be an increase in persecution of believers. And that's why Paul, under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, he is speaking about and to this congregation the Thessalonians, he's speaking about them because this is an example. What they're going through and, hear this, what they need to understand, and by the way, you need to understand it as well. What they need to understand is going to prepare them to be faithful in the midst of what they're going through and it will prepare you and me to be faithful for what's on the soon horizon and that is the coming of the last days. Well, take out your Bible and look with me to 2 Thessalonians and chapter one. Now, we left off with verse seven last week, speaking about the revealing of our Lord, Messiah Yeshua, Jesus Christ, and how he is coming. He is coming with flames of fire. That is a prophetic description of God's judgment being poured out, God's wrath being placed in this world. And he's coming. Who's going to be the ones who receive that? We see that he says two things. Those who do not know God. Now, we need to understand what that means. Do not know God. In Romans chapter 1, verse 19, God says, What can be known by God? God has placed within all humanity. He's done that through his conscience. He's given us a conscience. He put it in us that we might know God is, that God exists. 
and with that conscience we have the ability from God he's equipped us to understand a degree a portion of his his revelation people who reject Messiah who are not regenerated who are not born again who are not saved these individuals many of them can look at God's Word and say I understand that that lying's not good I understand that stealing's not right they can understand a portion a degree of God's revelation but what happens even though they know that God exists that there's a God out there creator God creation also reveals that fact but God's put it in through the conscience that he's equipped every human being with the knowledge that God exists and therefore when Paul says in in verse 7 that God's wrath this flames of fire is going to be poured out upon those first he says who do not know him now there's not a conflict it's not that they don't know him what it's saying is they do not acknowledge him they do not want to admit and have their lives reflect that they know there's a God what does that speak to one thing rebelliousness and the second thing he says that we saw at the end of our study last week is that they rejected that gospel message what is the gospel very simply it is good news about God's plan of redemption it's good news about a kingdom access through the work more specifically the blood of Messiah blood relates to redemption God offers this to the world we know that he in the last days it says for example two places in Matthew 24 verse 14 and also in Revelation 14 and verse 6 it says that this gospel of the kingdom is going to be proclaimed throughout all the world as a testimony to the nations God wants to save the nations one person at a time but the problem is those who's going to receive God's judgment his wrath are those who has rejected the gospel and that's what he says at the end of verse verse 7 and 8 and now let's look at our next verse 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 9 he says concerning these individuals denying God rejecting the gospel he says who will pay a price now this word for a price is literally the word that we understand as a fine it's a, a payment that you must make as a penalty. So there is going to be for those who deny God, reject the gospel, they are going to have to pay a penalty. And what is that, that, that fine? What is that payment that they're going to have to make? Notice it's a very expensive payment because he says here, it is eternal destruction. Destruction without end. And that is going to be initially in what we call the, the concept of hell. And ultimately, it's going to be eternal. And what the Bible says in the book of Revelation, that, that, that lake that burns with fire and brimstone. It never ends. That's why it says eternal destruction. And this is coming, and the language here is very specific. Many people say, well, I find it hard to believe in a God that would punish eternally and some torment and that's what the scripture uses the word torment I have a hard time accepting a God like this you can make the decision that you want God has given to all humanity the power to choose but but know what you're choosing if you reject God if you rebel against his truth if you do not accept the gospel the penalty that you will have to pay is a eternal destruction doesn't get worse than this and where's this eternal destruction coming from literally it says now we might translate it from the presence of the Lord but it literally means from the face of the Lord that is God is aware God is looking it is from him he is overseeing this this eternal destruction why holiness God's righteous character his holiness demands that he 
punishes sin. And sin brings about not just death, but eternal death. That's why we have that phrase, eternal destruction. So look again, verse 9. Who, these ones who reject the knowledge of God and the gospel, who will pay out a penalty, a fine. And that penalty is what? Eternal destruction from the presence of the Lord. And they're not going to experience, it says here, and from the glory of his power. Now, God, we need to understand that they're not going to experience God's glory. But God, and this is what the scripture is saying, God pouring out his wrath manifests his glory. When God judges sin, it is a glorious thing because it, it speaks to his righteousness, who he is. Now, God will judge sin, but he's also going to eternally destroy sin. And that's good. Why? Because sin is the cause of all your sorrow. I want to say that again. All of our sorrow, sadness, tears, and not just the emotional, but also we see that all sickness, all crime, everything that's bad in this world, everything that we would acknowledge is not good, is a consequence of sin. And we should be thankful. We should get a heavenly mentality. Why do I say that? Well, if you look, for example, at the book of Revelation in chapter 8, when we see God's wrath being poured out, for example, in, in chapter 16, these bold judgments of great measures of God's wrath being displayed, what's going on in the heavens? The heavens are praising God, rejoicing concerning, and the term that's found there is God's righteous judgment. And those on the earth that's receiving it, what does the scripture say? He says that they are unwilling to repent. They're unwilling to turn away from their sorcery, their, their sin, their thievery, their immorality. They don't want to change. God reveals himself through his wrath. And they would rather suffer eternal wrath from God than to embrace his standards, to acknowledge that sin, sin in their life. They don't want to confess that. They want to do their way. And we see that they won't leave their idolatry, which is a testimony that they want a religion that does what they determine, that they want to be in control. So it says that this judgment is from the very presence of God, and it's going to manifest. It's coming from the glory of his power. Verse 10. Whenever he should come, whenever this judgment should come through Messiah, it says it is going to be in glory and with his holiness. It is going to manifest God's holiness to the world. Now, understand holiness. We hear that. And many times we don't have a proper understanding of what God's talking about. When he speaks of holiness, he's speaking of that which is according to his purposes. So God must judge sin in order that his purposes, his will is manifested. And it's through the expression of his will when things are reflecting his order, that kingdom order, that glory is going to be manifested. So it speaks about here that he's going to come in glory with holiness his holiness but we can understand it this way his holy saints that's what the word is so God's bringing his holiness and who's that the saints why we have been transformed by redemption and through that redemption we become holy ones that's what the word saints means so he's bringing holiness who's that you and me into the world into his kingdom reality as an outcome from God judging. And it says, those who are believing, they're going to be amazed. They're going to marvel at this glorious kingdom of God. So God's wrath establishes the glory of his kingdom. And those who believe in him, 
we're going to be amazed. We're going to be caused to marvel at, at what God's plan ultimately is. So we need to pause and ask ourselves a question, and that's this. Do I want to be part of that kingdom? Do I want to know God's glory? Do I want God to work in my life that I would become a saint? Now, we need to understand this in two ways. God, the moment that you believe, God imputes to you righteousness so that you are seen by him because of the righteousness of Messiah. Not because who I am, but because who I become in Messiah. This new covenant relationship. So I become declared a saint by God with that assurance, with that promise. But my call now is to grow and mature and behave in a way that manifests his holiness through my life, through what I do and what I do not do. So when he comes, and this is how we know that we're speaking about the, the second coming. You know, people say all the times, get ready for the second coming, false teaching. Why? If you're a believer, you don't have to be ready for the second coming. You need to be ready for the rapture. You need to be ready for these last days. But see, learn the order. What's going to happen is this. We need to get ready for persecution, for what we're going to experience in the last days. That testimony, that mighty testimony, manifesting God's light through a powerful testimony. That's what we're supposed to be doing. And when that time is right, no one knows the day or the hour. What's going to happen? The heavens are going to be open up. There's going to be a shout of that shofar, that ram's horn. What does the shofar speak to? God's provision for victory. That's what we see in the book of Genesis in chapter 24, the first reference, that ram's horn, which is the shofar. It's blown for what reason? For the announcing that God provides what's necessary for victory. See, when, when God provided that ram caught in the thicket by his horns, it brought about the promise. What promise? Yitzchak, Isaac, didn't die. He experienced life for what God, because of what God provided. And then as God begins to explain this, he says in that same thing that God saw and he provided, and what's the outcome? that we are going to possess the gates of our enemies. So it's that possession of the gates of the enemies, which is an idiom for victory. So the shofar reminds us, God provides what's necessary for victory. And that's why that shofar is sounded, that ram's horn, at the time of the rapture. God's going to give us that new body, that glorified body, that body that's perfectly designed for the kingdom of God so that we can always and do nothing else but serve God perfectly, worship him properly. So we receive that at the time of the rapture. We go, we're brought into the kingdom of heaven where we're going to be with Messiah. And it's at the end of Daniel's 70th week that Messiah returns. And the scripture says, for example, we're in 2 Thessalonians, but in 1 Thessalonians, in chapter 3 and verse 13, it tells us that the saints, that's you and I, believers, the congregation of the redeemed, the church, is going to be coming with him. We're going to come with Messiah. So we don't have to get ready because when you take part in the rapture, you're with him, and when he comes, we're going to come with him. We're always going to be with him. The time to get ready now is for the rapture, not for the second coming. We're going to be in the kingdom with him. We will just naturally come. So it says here in speaking of this event, look at verse 10. Whenever he should come in glory with the saints, with his saints, and they will, will be amazed who will be those who are believing, they'll be amazed by all. Because of what reason? Because our testimony unto you was believed. Paul says the benefit is that you believe this testimony. It wasn't Paul's testimony. It's what God revealed to him. 
that gospel message that you believed that testimony our testimony unto you concerning what concerning that day and when we speak of in the scripture that day it's speaking about judgment day and that judgment day for a believer let me say it another way that judgment day for a saint is going to be a glorious day we are going to see the righteousness of God that was promised to us being explained to us being established being revealed to us with the establishment of the kingdom of God and that's what Paul is referring to here when he says in that day look at verse 11 for which also we pray always concerning you now he knows that they're suffering he knows that they're giving a testimony and he says this is the reason why that we pray always for you in order that you should be worthy what does that mean that we should have a proper and appropriate testimony that we should behave righteously as a child of God as the saints should behave that we should behave wordly worthily at because of the calling of our God God's given us a call and we should take that call apply it to our life and carry out that call the purposes of God in a worthy manner that's what Paul's saying and he says we're praying for you that that will be the reality of your life once again for which also we pray always concerning you in order that you shall be worthy of the call of our God and it says here the fulfillment of every good thinking of goodness now there's two different words in the Greek language here for good and what he says here is that we want good what's good the fulfillment of God's will so it says we are praying that you are used in order the goodness that good thought that God has which produces goodness meaning it reveals the goodness of God the character of God it says with works of faith how well putting truth into action that's what faith is there's an inherent relationship between that word faith and truth so we read and the works of faith in power now when we walk in faith when we live our life according to the truth we can be assured of something what is that that God is going to supply power to us when we say God I'm committed to your truth I'm going to obey your word and my utmost desire is to walk in humility submissively obediently to your revelation what your truth commands me to do now commandments of God do you know that there is a relationship between that word commandment and the concept of unity when we obey God now again we are not saved by obedience but if you're saved you will want to obey God that's that's our new nature we when we come to faith we turn to Messiah why because we want to turn away from sin we don't want to embrace that which is against his will we're turning to him for obedience we have been saved so that we can walk with with God in his purposes so when we make that decision we are going to receive power look now to, to verse 12 our last verse thus that the name of our Lord now name is synonymous with with character I say that a lot so when we read here that the name of our Lord should be glorified that's what we're concerned about we're not concerned about ourselves what people think of us we're not concerned with what we don't have or do have we're concerned with one thing that our life would be used in order to glorify the name of the Lord 
And I think it's so important here that God is spoken of here. It's Messiah. We believe in the divinity of Christ. And it's so important that instead of his name, Yeshua, or Savior, that he's called Lord. Why? If we want to manifest God's glory, if we want to properly glorify the, the, the Savior, we have to acknowledge him as Lord of our life. So thus, that the name of our Lord should be glorified. Who's our Lord? Messiah Yeshua. And he says, in you, that's what we're supposed to do, in our lives, and he says, you in him. Now, what's it speaking about here? You in him speaks about that intimacy, that, that experiencing of God's presence. And it's when we are obeying his word that we find ourselves, notice what it says, that, that he's going to act, behave, work out his purposes in you, and you are going to be drawn closer to being in him, that, that intimacy, that presence of God. According to the grace of our God, and Lord Messiah Yeshua. Now, he ends this first chapter with this concept, grace, why? Now, we know grace saves, but there's another aspect of the grace of God. God's grace saves us. Yes, it does. Saves us eternally, that we might have assurance. But God's grace has a second purpose, and that is that God's grace moves in our life. It works in order to bring us to fulfill the will of God. God's grace, when we receive it, we're gonna have a new, a different perspective. We're gonna have that renewing of, of the spirit within us. And that renewing of the spirit is when we move closer and closer and closer to the will of God, obeying the purposes of God and doing that which brings him glory. So God's grace, it moves in our life so that we can manifest the glory of God and have what's so precious to Him and what should be our utmost desire, and that is to have, and hear this, a God-pleasing testimony. So let me close with that sentence. Do you have a testimony that's pleasing to God? That's what is of interest to your Lord and Savior. I'll close with that. Shalom.